Hello and welcome to hashtag Doc Talk Live. This is North Bay Healthcare's way to re reach out to the community on important health issues. With us today is orthopedic surgeon Neil Patari, and he's going to be talking about knee pain and some of the treatment options. Dr. Patari, take it away. Great, thanks so much. Again, my name is Dr. Neil Patari. I'd like to thank uh, Robin and Kelly for setting this up this evening. Um, I'm an orthopedic surgeon specializing in sports medicine, so I primarily see knee and shoulder issues, um, but I also see general orthopedics, so I'll see all parts of the, all parts of the musculoskeletal system. Um, so today what I'd like to do is take some time to review some common knee pathologies, uh, talk about their diagnosis, and then talk about their treatment as well. So you can see here I've got a knee model. I think it would be a great idea for us to go through some of the basic anatomic structures so everyone's on the same page and we kind of know all the terminology I'll be referencing. So right here we have a right knee model. So the knee joint consists of three separate compartments. So right in the front we have a bone called the patella. So we flip that open like there. Uh, the patella articulates with the distal end of the femur right here. So that forms the patellofemoral joint. The inside part of the knee joint right here, this is called your medial compartment. And then the outside part of the knee joint right here is called your lateral compartment. So going back to the outside of the knee, we have ligaments on the outside of the knee help provide stability. These are called the collateral ligaments. So on the outside here, we have something called the LCL, the lateral collateral ligament. And then we have something called the MCL, which is called the medial collateral ligament. So what these do is they provide stability, what we call varus valgus stress. So stability from the, what we have called right here, called varus stress and then valgus stress where the knee goes outwards like that. Going into the knee joint again, First thing we see right through here is these two ligaments. So these are two of the most important ligaments inside the knee. They're called the cruciate ligaments and they're so called because they cross each other. So I'm sure you've heard of the anterior cruciate ligament before the ACL. It's a very commonly injured um, ligament in athletic injuries. And that is this ligament right here. And the main function of the ACL is basically to prevent excess anterior translation of the tibia. So this bone from moving forward it also helps prevent any excess rotatory um, issues with the tibia. Um, the PCL uh, is the opposite, helps prevent the tibia from moving backwards. Looking further into the knee here, we have the meniscus. So we have the medial meniscus and the lateral meniscus. So the meniscus is basically two structures uh, which serve as a cushion. They're almost like a shock absorber for the knee. So they distribute the force that transmits from the femur down through the tibia and it spreads that force out evenly. Um, so that's kind of in a nutshell. One, one other thing I want to mention, so cartilage obviously is also a really important structure in the knee. So it's the white on the end of the chicken bone. It's that slick surface. So there's cartilage all along, all along this area right here, the distal end of the femur. There's a very, very thick layer of cartilage underneath the patella. And then also the tibial plateau right here has a thick layer of cartilage on it as well. So that in a nutshell is kind of some basic knee anatomy, which I'll be referencing uh, throughout the length of our talk tonight. So uh, the first problem, the first knee pathology I wanted to talk to you about tonight is something called patellofemoral syndrome. So this is by far the most common knee issue that I see um, every day in patients. What it basically is, it's an irritation of the structures in the front of the knee. So again, going back to the model here, it's an irritation of structures in the front of the knee. Sometimes you can get some softening of the cartilage underneath the kneecap through here. Um, and the pathogenesis of the cause for this pain is usually a maltracking or a muscle imbalance. So what can happen is the patella can maltrack. You can see here that this is a nice V shape and it fits nicely into the groove. So if you have any type of maltracking where the patella comes off to the side, that can predispose you to getting pain, irritation in the front of the knee. Uh, the other thing is if you have a really tight quadriceps muscle, so if you look on the side, this is the quadriceps tendon. The quadriceps muscle would be right here. If you have a really, really tight quadriceps muscle, that can actually push down on this joint and it can e lead to increased pressure in here and that can worsen the symptoms. Um, so commonly what you hear for patellofemoral syndrome, you'll hear patients complain of pain going up and down stairs, um, pain with squatting and with lunges, and then sometimes runners will also get this. It's also called a runner's knee. So the good news is it's very easy to treat. So the way we treat this is we address, um, uh, the way we treat this again is physical therapy, home exercises, uh, we do anti-inflammatory uh, medications. In rare circumstances, we might use a cortisone injection. Uh, it's really easy to diagnose in the office. So when you come in, you'll get a thorough physical examination. We'll get x-rays where we can go over all the alignment of the knee joint. Um, an important thing to focus is also looking at not just the knee joint, but also the hip joint, and then also the ankle joint. There are different 
uh, things in terms of weakness of your hip musculature, for example, um, that can lead to maltracking. If you have any type of flat foot deformity or anything like that, that also, and poor shoes um, that don't provide support, that also can lead to issues with your knee joint. So um, it's really a comprehensive exam that you'd be getting um, when you come in. And again, we talked about all the treatment options that you would have. Um, usually in the vast majority of patients, that simple basic physical therapy, home exercises, anti-inflammatory medications, and icing, a little bit of activity modification really takes care of this problem really well. So moving on into the knee now, I want to talk about uh, another very, very common issue that I see in patients. So that's meniscus tear. I'm sure everyone knows of someone or um, has a friend or has had a meniscal tear before. So again, going back to the knee model, the meniscus, there's these two round structures right here. And the main function of the meniscus is to provide um, force distribution so that way you don't have point loading on the cartilage. Um, and this basically helps preserve the life of the cartilage and it decreases the amount of stress on the cartilage. So a lot of patients will end up with wear and tear as time goes on. Um, like anything in life, things can wear down, like your knee, your meniscus can wear down. So you can end up with something called a degenerative meniscus tear. Now, the good news is all meniscus tears do not need surgery. Um, degenerative meniscus tears, we usually treat them with basic things, physical therapy, home exercises, oral anti-inflammatory medications, cortisone injection, icing, anti-inflammatory, excuse me, uh, activity modification. Um, usually that will do the trick. And the reason being, most degenerative tears, the meniscus is a little bit weak, it's a little bit brittle. So given enough time, it can actually smooth itself down to the point where the tear actually won't bother you. Um, in rare circumstances, if patients do have continued pain with conservative management, if they have anything like mechanical symptoms, meaning if the knee locks, click it, clicks, or catches, um, that could be a more serious issue. For example, if they have a flap of meniscus tissue, and that would necessitate surgery. So surgery for meniscus, it's really simple surgery. Outpatient procedure um, usually takes about anywhere from 10 to 15 minutes, depending on the tear pattern. It's two small incisions that we make in the front of the knee joint, and we go in one end with what's something called an arthroscope. So that's a little instrument that has a camera around it uh, at the end of it, excuse me. And then we have all of our instruments that we use, our shavers, our biters, that we use to clean up the meniscus coming through the other portal. And at that same time, we're able to take a look at the entire knee, um, the joints, the cartilage surface, etc., and we can see if there's anything else going on in the knee that needs to be addressed. Um, going back to the meniscus here, um, in a younger population, meniscus tears are also very common. If they have a cutting athlete that has an ACL tear, for example, um, they can be commonly associated with meniscal tears. So in a young athlete, we try our best to fix these tears. The reason being, again, the meniscus can help preserve um, the force transmission between the femur and the tibia. And that's what we want, because if we just go in there and we don't fix the meniscus, if we take it out, those patients we, we've come to learn will develop arthritis at a later point in life. Uh, because they don't now have point loading. Now the force transmitted from the femur to the tibia isn't nice and spread out evenly. Now it's point loading and the cartilage doesn't like that, so it can end up degenerating. Um, and there's a lot of different techniques uh, depending on what type of meniscus uh, tear pattern there is. One of the most common patterns I'll see in a younger athlete is something called a bucket handle tear. We have a severe twisting injury. And what will actually happen if you look here is the meniscus will tear in a circumferential pattern all the way around the rim. And then what will happen is, the reason it's called a bucket handle tear is because the central part will actually bucket handle out and will go into the central part of the knee. So what happens is the pa when the patient comes in, the athlete comes in, they're not even able to straighten out the knee mm -hmm. completely because that meniscus is stuck in the middle part of the knee joint. So that's a really big issue. Obviously, you don't want patients to weight bear. Um, that can further extend the tear. Um, so we usually get to these types of tears pretty quickly um, and we'll do a repair where we'll put in at least at least seven to eight sutures, sometimes even more if the tear pattern uh, necessitates and fix, fix the meniscus that way. Um, another kind of more special uh, meniscal tear that we don't see as commonly, but I'd say in the last probably seven to 10 years has really come to light and we're doing a lot more um, research on it and figuring out the best way to treat these is something called a meniscal root tear. So a meniscus right through here, again, there's two round structures through here. I don't know if you can see that there, but it attaches all the way at the back called the posterior root, and there's also something called the anterior root attachment. So um, in certain select patients in their 50s and 60s, if they end up developing or have a root tear, usually from an acute trauma, that's a very serious injury because the meniscus can actually extrude. So extrude means the meniscus can pop out 
when the meniscus pops out, it doesn't function anymore in terms of being a shock absorber and preventing uh, and spreading out that force transmission between the femur and the tibia. So um, if certain patients meet criteria, if they had don't have many degenerative changes, um, if they're willing to undergo the rehab and all the um, post-operative protocols, there's a special procedure we do called a root repair where we put in some heavy-duty sutures into the actual meniscus uh, and then we make a little tunnel directly where the root normally attaches and then we pull those sutures down through there. So that's more of a specialty type of procedure um, that we talk about and that we perform for the meniscus. So moving on, uh, one of the next things I wanted to talk about here uh, is your ACL. So your anterior cruciate ligament. Like I mentioned before, I'm sure you have all had a family member, a friend that has suffered from this type of injury. Or anybody who watches football. Or anybody who watches football. Exactly, yeah. exactly. So this is, you know, if you put on ESPN, um, and, you know, any given Sunday, you'll, you'll hear about somebody tearing their ACL uh, on the injury list. So why is the ACL so important to the athlete? So the ACL, again, goes right through here. It starts in the inside part of the femur, and it goes down to the tibia. And again, what it does is it helps prevent the tibia from moving forward. And it also provides some rotatory stability to the knee. So the reason this is so important in athletes, especially cutting athletes, so soccer players, football players, basketball players, skiers, is because in order for them to function and cut and pivot, they need to have an intact ACL. Otherwise, the knee is going to buckle. The knee will give out on them. It'll, it'll slide and it'll feel like the knee is going to give out and literally their leg will buckle. So in young athletes, we reconstruct these. You know, there's... Um, there's been a lot of um, uh, techniques that have advanced uh, to make this a very commonplace and very successful procedure. Um, so the, ba the basic way that this happens, again, it's a nutshell, it's a very, uh, very short version of what happens in this surgery. We debride out the old ACL, we make a new tunnel that comes out right where the old ACL attaches, and then we make another tunnel in the femur where the other part of the ACL attaches to. There's different graphs that we can use. My preference for a graph for a young athlete, uh, be that a high school athlete or a college athlete um, or a, a semi-professional athlete would be something called a bone patellar tendon bone autograft. So what we do there is I take harvest the central one third of the patellar tendon. I take a small fragment of the patella and a small fragment of the tibial tubercle. So once that graft is harvested and it's prepared, what we do is we pass that graft through those previously made tunnels in the tibia and then into the femur, and then the graft is held in place with a screw in the femur and then the tibia. Um, and that's in a nutshell what an ACL reconstruction is. Uh, again, a highly successful operation allows athletes to get back on the field, get back to those pivoting and those cutting, ex um, cutting exercises. Um, the last thing I want to kind of go over today is the cartilage. So cartilage, again, like we mentioned, is on the end of all the bones. So it's on the end of the femur bone all through here. It's also on the end of the patella. The patella cartilage is actually some of the thickest cartilage in the body. And then there's also cartilage on the undersurface uh, right here. And it's called the tibial plateau. Uh, in older patients, you know, we're talking about patients when you start getting in your 50s and 60s, like anything in the body, the you can get wear and tear. You can get degenerative changes. So degenerative changes in the knee joint are typically called osteoarthritis. So osteoarthritis is a degenerative condition where there's wear and tear and the cartilage can wear away. So when the cartilage does wear away, um, there's different gradations of arthritis, different scales based on clinical, based on radiographic. Um, so when it does wear away, you end up getting bone, right? So that's one of the things that can cause pain. So what are the ways that we can treat arthritis? Luckily, we've got a lot of options short of surgery that we can use to treat arthritis. We do things simple as, again, physical therapy. The goal of therapy, again, is to strengthen all of the muscles around the knee joint to take some of the strain off of the knee. Um, activity modification, so obviously um, we want to decrease some of those activities that are causing pain for a short amount of time. A lot of times arthritis can be very cyclical. There can be months and months where it's totally fine, and then you can have a little innocuous type injury where you twist it and you can flare up your arthritis. So activity modification plays a big role. Uh, there are different types of medications, oral anti-inflammatory medications, anti-inflammatory creams, icing plays a big role. Um, usually those, that's what we start with. When a patient first comes to me to see me in the office and we diagnose them with osteoarthritis of the knee, we'll start with all those basic things. 
Other options we have are something called the cortisone injection that we talked about earlier, so just an anti-inflammatory medication. Um, there is something called the visco supplementation injection um, that is shown to be very successful as well. Um, that typically I'll offer to patients who have more minor to moderate arthritis. It typically doesn't work as well if you have very severe arthritis, unfortunately. What a visco supplementation injection is, it's a thick gel. Constitutes, it's constituted from hyaluronic acid. So hyaluronic acid is basically one of the constituents of normal joint fluid. Uh, and basically in the lab, they've reproduced this hyaluronic acid. Um, and it's literally a thick gel that gets injected into the knee. Um, there's very, various formulations, various companies um, that we use out there. Uh, the way it works is basically a simple injection. You come into the office for once a week for three weeks, uh, you get the injection, um, and then hopefully that works out for you. So that is, uh, that is something short of knee surgery, a total knee replacement that we have an option for. Um, cartilage also, obviously, it doesn't just, ours injuries don't affect older populations, they affect younger athletic populations as well. Um, patients that get ACL injuries, for example, meniscus tears, they can sometimes have combined cartilage injuries. So um, they can typically happen in what we call the weight-bearing zone of the femur. So you can see right here, this anatomically is called your medial femoral condyle. This is called your lateral femoral condyle through here. So sometimes patients can end up with a shear injury where they actually knock off a little piece of cartilage. So luckily we have a lot of different options here for um, cartilage restoration procedures, what they're called. If patients have a focal area that's not diffuse osteoarthritis, diffuse degenerative changes. So the most simple of this is something called the microfracture procedure. So what happens is if you have a circular lesion, let's say it's about a centimeter um, in diameter here, what we can do is clean out to the base of the lesion, and then what we'd use is a, a, it's a tool called an awl. So it's got a little short, sharp point to it, and we make a series of consecutive holes in the base of the lesion, and the thought process is it creates stem cells um, all the marrow constituents come out and they form a little clot right over the actual area. So that clot eventually will turn into something called fibrocartilage. Now, fibrocartilage isn't the same thing as hyaline cartilage. Hyaline cartilage is what you're born with, right? It's what your uh, knee has right when you're born with. Fibrocartilage is good, but it doesn't have the same wear property. So it's not gonna be the exact same uh, as hyaline cartilage, but patients will still get a good clinical result from that procedure. Um, other options out there, there's something called an OATS procedure. Uh, that's an osteochondral allograft transfer. So what happens there is we take a piece of cartilage and the underlying bone from, say, an area here. This area right here is anatomically called the intercondylar notch. So the cartilage is not as important, not as vital here. So we'll take a plug from here and literally we'll carve out a cylinder in the area where the defect is and we'll transplant that plug from this location to this location and make sure that the cartilage surface is nice and smooth. So the good thing about this is it's not fibrocartilage, right? It's actually transferring hyaline cartilage from one area of the knee to another. Um, another option for cartilage restoration is something called a Macy procedure. Uh, that's something called a matrix-induced um, autocyte, um, autologous transfer, excuse me. So what happens there, it's a pretty complex procedure. We have a two-stage procedure where the first time we go in, we'll take a cartilage biopsy. So we'll literally take some cartilage from some areas, again, from an area that's not as important in the knee, and that cartilage actually gets sent to a lab. And once it gets sent to a lab, it gets replicated and it gets put into a little matrix. So a matrix is um, a little collagen um, type of material that we can actually cut out the shape of, and then we can actually glue that in uh, with the fiber and glue directly into the base of that defect through there. So that kind of in a nutshell is uh, some of the things I wanted to go through. I hope this was helpful for you. Again, um, these are just some of the few diagnoses that I see on a common, common basis. I tried to pick a few things that I commonly see in the office. So if there's anybody that's suffering from any of these types of injuries, uh, I'd be more than happy to see in the office. And obviously we're on the Facebook live stream right now. So um, I welcome any questions. Well, we have a few questions that have come in. Sure. And thank you for those of you who are posting a question. All you have to do is hit the comment button and type it in. We'll be able to see it and pass it along. Raquel is asking, is surgery the only option when the cartilage is gone from the knee area? Uh, so Raquel's question to repeat, um, is surgery the only option if cartilage is gone? So uh, great question. Again, it really depends on uh, the size of the cartilage lesion, right? A lot of times if we're talking about a diffuse osteoarthritis, we're talking about degenerative changes that are very diffuse in the knee joint. 
Um, then we're looking at all of the conservative management that we talked about, right? Eventually, if those conservative managements, including the injections, don't work out in the patient's um, to the point where they can only walk a few blocks and you know the pain is keeping them up at night and it's really affecting their activities of daily living and their quality of life, that patient may be a candidate for a knee replacement. Now, if we're talking a more focal lesion, um, then obviously we try the basic things also, but um, typically in my experience, those focal lesions in a really highly athletic person, those are gonna be symptomatic and those usually need some type of surgical treatment done. Jim is asking, is it, and his question is really about knee replacement, though mm -hmm. we haven't been talking about that tonight, sure. nonetheless. Is it possible to wait too long to have a knee replacement where there's not enough good bone remaining to seat sure. the prosthetic in? So to um, address your question about if it's possible to wait too long, uh, that's an interesting question because we typically like to wait on a, a little bit longer, meaning if you have someone who's 45 and who has horrible arthritis, um, we like to wait a little bit longer with the conservative management. The reason being, all of these implants have a shelf life, right? It's like a car. The more you use it, the more you potential have to break, to break down, parts to break down. So if you have a patient that's really young and they get a knee replacement, there's a high likelihood that they're gonna be more active than let's say a 60 year old or 70 year old that gets a knee replacement, right? And all of these things are metal uh, and there's a piece of plastic in between so they can wear, right? They have the plastic can wear away. Um, the metal is cemented into bone, so that interface can also can also get weak. So, um, in terms of if it's too long to wait, you know that's an it's an interesting question. It really depends on your on your clinical situation um, and your age. You know, it depends on how much deformity you have. Um, obviously, if you're to the point where there's a severe deformity, a varus deformity like we talked about with the knee bending in severely, uh, those can be a little bit difficult to little bit more difficult to do a total knee on. Um, a valgus knee is the opposite where the leg is coming outwards uh, in this direction where the femur would be coming out and you're compressing there. So they do make the procedures a little bit more complex, not to say that they can't be done, um, but I suppose you know it, it all depends truthfully on your age, what type of treatment you've had and how severe the deformity is. Um, so that's kind of, that's how I would answer that question. He's also asking about something called a synvisc injection mm -hmm. and um, wondering if you have any advice on how to get his insurance to cover it because currently he doesn't. I, I don't yeah. know how much you get into coverage with your patients. Yeah, so the question was about um, Synvisc, what is it, and then in terms of insurance coverage. So uh, Synvisc is actually one of the brands of visco supplementation that we use uh, in the office. So I use the three injection series and again, um, that's just one of the ones, one of the companies that we use. Um, in terms of insurance companies, uh, there are some insurance companies that don't approve it um, right off the bat. Um, for those insurance companies, we have to prove several things in terms of uh, failure of physical therapy, um, failure of anti-inflammatory medication. Sometimes they ask us to use two different types of anti-inflammatories. Uh, sometimes they want us to use a topical anti-inflammatory. Um, occasionally they'll want a certain amount of physical therapy, you know, a certain amount of weeks of physical therapy. Um, but you know, if, if the financial issue is that they just don't um, allow it, some of these companies, they understand that out-of-pocket cost is quite high for these types of uh, medications, these types of injections. So they do have self-pay programs if it really comes to that and the insurance is just flat out refusing to pay for it. Great. How does a person tell if what they're experiencing is arthritis? or a strain or something more serious than that? Sure, so the question is how does a patient differentiate whether or not they have arthritis versus a strain? So, um, you know, it's a difficult question to answer because it's essentially what I, what I do in the office, right? So for you to be at home and be able to discern, it may be difficult. Um, strains are typically muscle pain. Um, osteoarthritis, you know, it's different types, of, different types of pain. You'll get joint line pain, you'll get um, clicking sensations, you'll occasionally get swelling in the joint. So um, it's obviously one of those things where you could Google and things like that, commonly get patients trying to um, you know, diagnose themselves. But I would say if you're having any issues with your, with your knee or you know, affecting your quality of life, your um, daily activities, come on in. You know, we're, we've got same day, next day appointments. We try and get patients in as quickly as we can because uh, we don't want them to be in pain uh, you know, for any longer than they have to be. Um, we're here, we're um, you know, completely COVID compliant. Everybody is checked at the door with their temperatures. All the employees are wearing masks full time. Every single room is 
completely sanitized. So um, if you're having any issues, I would say come on in, get it checked out. It's completely safe um, at this point in time. Okay. Jim's asking about infection rates. He's mm -hmm. talking specifically about knee replacements, but sure. I'm curious, let's expand it out yeah. to all the surgeries you've been detailing here. You know, how, how worried should people be about infection? Yeah, so generally speaking, for any arthroscopic procedure that, that I perform, um, you know, it obviously differs for every single type of uh, procedure that we're talking about, whether it's uh, an ACL reconstruction versus just a simple knee arthroscopy. But I can tell you generally for any arthroscopic procedure, the infection rate is extremely, extremely low. We're talking um, significantly less than 1%. And one of the reasons for that is we're constantly irrigating the knee out with fluid, right? The whole case is just fluid running in through the knee and out through the knee. So um, I'd say for an arthroscopic procedure, you're looking at uh, less than, significantly less than 1%. Um, in terms of infection rate for a total joint, um, I think the national average is probably around like 1%. Um, one sometime, you know, some people will, point, will quote about 2% for a, for a total knee or a, a total hip arthroplasty. Um, for the large joint replacement centers, it's typically around 1% infection rate. Okay. Heather's asking, what can be done to help with pain associated with osteoarthritis? Sure. So Heather, again, um, um, question was, what can be done to um, address the pain associated with osteoarthritis? So again, osteoarthritis to review is a degenerative condition. It's a wearing away of the cartilage. So I always start in my office with uh, the diagnosis will entail a formal physical examination um, of the knee. We'll get x-rays. Uh, I like getting weight-bearing x-rays so we can see what the joint surface looks like. We can see if there's any narrowing. Um, and then what we'll do is we usually start with basic things, like I'd mentioned, so it's physical therapy. The goals of therapy are to strengthen all of the surrounding muscles. Um, that's gonna take some of the load off of the knee. We'll create a home exercise program for you to kind of improve your flexibility, um, improve the strength around all the muscles of your knee, but not just your knee, we'll focus on your hip as well. Um, the hip is a really important joint when you're dealing with knee pain. You wanna make sure that you have a nice strong um, hip girdle musculature in order to uh, make sure you're not putting too much strain on your knee. Um, oral anti-inflammatories, topical anti-inflammatories, that plays a really important role in treatment. Um, activity modification, like I had mentioned, a lot of times you can have um, you know, a patient that's doing a lot of squats and lunges, you know, they're going to the gym, so things like that can really inflame the arthritis, so we wanna hold off on those, stay away from those for a few weeks, let things calm down. Um, and again, conservatively, we always have the option of a cortisone injection um, or the visco supplementation, the synvisc injection, which we just talked about. Um, you're a nice doctor and people would love to come see you, but what if they don't want to come see you? How do they keep their knees healthy and avoid getting an injury in the first place? Sure. Um, so obviously, if um, in terms of staying healthy, uh, if you don't want to come in for an office visit, um, one of the one things I wanted to mention is that we do have video visits available. So um, that is something in this time for patients that still don't feel comfortable coming into the office. Um, we do make the uh, um, we do make the possibility for video visits, um, and they're you know they're great, they're fantastic. We um, the connection is excellent. You know it's not choppy at all. So um, the only downside of that is we can't do a formal physical examination, but Obviously, if you come in, we can get x-rays. Um, but in terms of general knee health, you know, the things that you want to do to stay healthy are like anything else. You want to stay um, active. You want to make sure you have a well-balanced diet. You want to make sure you're exercising, um, keeping your weight down. Those are all things that can really, um, really benefit with um, any joint for that matter. And then just your overall health as well. And are people who've been who've suffered a knee injury or a surgery even before, are they more at risk for re-injury? Sure. So the question is, uh, if you've had an injury before, a surgery before, are you more at risk of injury? So that's an interesting question uh, that Robin poses. You know, there are some diagnoses out there, even after surgery, that put you at an increased risk. I'll give you an example is um, female athletes with an ACL reconstruction. So we know that female athletes at a baseline compared to their um, male counterparts, um, we're talking about adolescents, teenagers, they're at a substantially increased risk of getting an ACL tear compared to their male counterparts, and there's uh, anatomical reasons, hormonal reasons, um, neuromuscular reasons for that. Um, they don't have the female's landing mechanics compared to males. Um, they have what's called a valgus knee, so they put a tremendous amount of force on their ACL. So females, believe it or not, are one of the, um, one of the, uh, the genders that are gonna be 
at an increased risk of getting a repeat ACL injury, not only to the same knee, but to the contralateral knee. So that's one of the things I can think off at the top of my head. Um, other than that, different types of pathologies, you know, there's so many different pathologies that we deal with that we fix. Um, but generally, uh, besides that one, um, we generally try and fix these and, you know, fix them for life so they don't bother you down the line. Great. Well, we're hitting right up on our, thir well, we're exactly at our 30 minute limit. So sure. um, just a reminder, if you guys have questions, you can still post them even after the the chat ends, we can always email them to sure. Dr. Patari and get answers for you. Our next Doc Talk is on Tuesday, June, or I'm sorry, the 29th at 6 p.m. with Dr. Snow talking about giving her talk on menopause, which she calls dribbling, drooping, and drying up. Proper ladies do talk about such things. So we wanna make sure you tune in for that. If you want to reach Dr. Partari, his office number is 646-5599. That's the 707 area code. So thank you all for tuning in and thank you, Dr. Patari, sure, for your of time. Course. Thank you so much.